Welcome to Disaffected. I'm Joshua Slocum, and this is the show where we talk about politics and culture through a psychological lens, most particularly about the kinds of abuse dynamics and emotional distortions that have taken over our public discourse, our relationships between other people, our politics, and uh, the kinds of dynamics that are engendered when we are around people who have what are called cluster B personality disorders. These are borderline, narcissistic, antisocial, and histrionic. And it's the thesis of this show that these kinds of personality disorders, which are usually found um, at the root of domestic abuse, interfamily abuse, and child abuse, are now, well, they've gone feral. They're out of the house, and they're, and they're happening in public now, too. So... Um, as a reminder, everybody, we do have a website if you are looking to support us, and some of you do. Thank you very much. Uh, it takes money to run this show, and we appreciate your help. Uh, if you're looking to subscribe to us on video, if you're looking to uh, listen to us on audio, all you have to do is remember our website, disaffected.fm. Disaffected.fm. And we're everywhere that you can ordinarily find podcasts. iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Pandora, we're also on Rumble and YouTube with video. So thank you very much. Check us out online. Um, I want to mention also, um, I appeared on one of my favorite podcasts. I know I talk about it a lot, but they're so good. Uh, they deserve it. Unsafe Space with Carter Laren and Carrie Smith. Uh, this past Friday, you can look them up on YouTube. You can look them up on their site, unsafespace.com. And we did a long uh, conversation about... It's actually really funny. Dissociative identity disorder or what you probably know or may remember as multiple personality disorder, which was known even before that name as a split personality. Um, if you're looking for a borderline hoedown, look no further than the episode of that show. So check it out. <laughs> I want to... I want to add a coda or a clarification to something I spoke about last week um, in terms of trans activism and trans ideology being a, a women's social project. I have said before that I've become frustrated with the claim by many women that trans ideology, the idea that you can simply assert that you're a woman, even if you're a man, and, and merely asserting that and perhaps putting on a party wig and some cheek drugstore lipstick will make you a woman, the idea that um, such men should be treated as women for the purposes of going into female locker rooms, female domestic violence shelters, uh, for the purposes of competing on sports teams, both at the high school level and uh, the college level and the Olympic level. Um, many women have described this as a, a project of men's rights activists, and I don't think that it is. Um, I recognize that at the center of this project that many of the most outspoken activists happen to be men. Oh, excuse me, trans women. They're men. And it, it isn't that I don't recognize that. Um, what I'm saying is that the number of women who promote trans ideology as something that you have to be in support of if you are a liberal, if you are a compassionate person, if you are a leftist. This is very much, um, the women far outnumber the men in this. Um, and I see it as a co-optation, a hijacking, and a redirection of female typical psychological traits such as agreeableness, wanting to build relationships, not to burn bridges, to mend fences, to preserve social connections. Th that's how I see it. But I do, I do want to say, and a, a couple of self-described radical feminists showed up in the comments under our show last week, and, and this is a common kind of pushback that that people like me, men like me, get from such women. Uh, they're they're very angry. Um, if anybody describes this as, as a women's project. And I want to clarify something, uh, especially, especially if you are a radical feminist or if you have radical feminist sympathies. 
I recognize that radical feminists are the ones who are speaking out the most about this, okay? There are some radical feminist principles, and I'm not going to get into a, a long definition of radical feminism on this show. You can look it up online and, and see what you think about the positions that people hold who call themselves radical feminists. There's a lot of wisdom and insight to be gained by taking radical feminism seriously. I have serious disagreements with some portions of it, but it's not a global disagreement. Um, Think of it like a buffet. I think some things on there are great. I think other things I could leave behind. It's not my project anyway. But I do recognize, women, if you're watching this and if you consider yourself a radical feminist, I know that you are at the coalface with this. Believe it or not, if you're new to me, you wouldn't necessarily know that for a long time I had a, a, a lot of radical feminists in my friend circles. I didn't kick those radical feminists out of my friendship circles, they kicked me out of their friendship circles. Because I do strongly disagree with some of the ideas that are put forward by radical feminism. I disagree with their characterization of what they call male typical behavior. I disagree with, I disagree with the way they describe the narcissistic and sometimes sociopathic activities that are undertaken by men with personality disorders who call themselves trans women. Many radical feminists describe this as male typical behavior. This is just patriarchy, it's male typical, it's misogyny. I don't think that it is. I, I would describe it instead as male typical behavior in the context of a man who has a cluster B personality disorder. I don't think no, it's not just that I don't think. I know. This is not male typical behavior. It is not male typical to threaten women with rape. It is not male typical to, to beat women up. It is not male typical to lie and pretend that you are a woman uh, so that you can basically erase the existence of actual women and put on a skin suit or a costume and have other people believe that you're a woman. These are things that are very, very typical of male trans activists, but the commonality here, or not the commonality, the, the root problem here is not being a male. The root problem is having a cluster B personality disorder. A lot of them look like they have uh, a healthy dose each of borderline and narcissistic personality disorder, and some of the most aggressive of these trans activists, these male trans activists, these trans women, some of them I think are straight up psychopaths. Absolutely. I think they're dangerous. Um, and I think they probably have skeletons in their closet. Perhaps some literally. So I, I, I want to say that um, nothing I say that that qualifies my views is going to make me palatable to many radical feminists. So I'm not going to try to do that. But I do recognize that you women, you radical feminists who are making noise on Twitter, who are petitioning the government, who are speaking up more loudly than anyone else about transing children. I see the work you do. I applaud the work you do. I agree with you on these things. I know that you won't have any of me. That's fine. Um, but I'm, I'm, I still clap for you um, because you are braver than most people and you're certainly braver than most women in this context. So that's the end of that. I also want to, I want to read a couple of, of audience emails. I love getting email. Um, I thank you for it. I like the interaction. And I know I've said this many times before, but I'm going to say it again. We are going to have some interaction. We're thinking about kinds of shows that we can have where there might be live chat. There might be actual live dialogue between me and, and those of you watching. It just takes a lot of time to schedule this stuff um, when you're two guys like Kevin and I are who have day jobs. Um, and also... I hope I don't get too shiny, but oh my God, it's hot in Burlington, Vermont today, and I can barely think straight. So I'm trying to put a show together for you today and make coherent sense for you while I'm broiling, which is why I'm not wearing a jacket. Um, but those things are coming. I thank you for your patience. But in the meantime, I, I love the fact that you write to me, and I, I want to read a couple to you. This one came, um, I'm going to use first names. This is the kind of show where I know that some of you who watch the show, listen to the show, maybe donate to the show, probably don't want to be named publicly. 
uh, because we talk about controversial things. So I'm going to try to respect that, but I do know who you are. I'd give you, I'd give you full credit if I thought you'd appreciate it, but I think you probably wouldn't. So this first one here is from a viewer named Mia, and she writes, excuse me, got to put on my borderline glasses. Hi, Josh. Thank you for the email and thank you for the show. I've gained so much insight into the human psyche and how our world is so polluted by it. I'm a graduate student deemed unessential during the pandemic, so I've been financially hit by this idiotic government. Luckily, I have my position back, but I'm ready to step out of the field of academia and into the private sector as soon as possible. I have experienced pushback from professors and colleagues for refusing to use pronouns, and they don't even know about my political or cultural beliefs. I think because of my minority status, they assume that I'm not conservative or I'm not a free thinker. I work in a branch of science. My field is not totally corrupted, but I think it will be negatively affected in my lifetime. Enough of my insight. Well, no, not actually enough. You make sense. You could have written more. So write again. I have, I have a question. You've mentioned emotional contamination reaction, which I definitely experience. What methods do you use to work through that programming? I was never a liberal, but I've always been a student of the state. So I know that I suffer from this as well. What method do I use to work through the emotional contamination react? The emotional contamination, uh, my description of this, what I'm talking about is when you hear somebody state a political position that strikes you as extreme or not something that nice people say or not something that free thinking, cap uh, not capital, small L liberal people would say, one sometimes gets that, ooh, is that okay to say? And underneath that, is that okay to say, at least what happens in my head is, is it okay for me to like that? Is it okay for me to have a positive emotional reaction? This is sometimes what happens in my head. That's the programming, right? And I, I, I talked about it in the context um, this last week when I was on un Unsafe Space. I told Carter, Carter Laren, one of the hosts, that I often find myself listening to their show and Carter will say something. Carter, Carter is um, an anarcho-capitalist. I mean, he's way beyond libertarian. Um, he's ready for a secession. He wants a national divorce. And, and what I told him was... I heard him say that, and I had that initial reaction, ooh, that's extreme, and oh, is it okay? Is it okay if I feel a little positive about that? And I find that a week later, something that sounded extreme to him, uh, that, that, that sounded extreme to me, is a position that on a week's reflection, I end up agreeing with. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty ready for, for a national divorce as well. I do actually question whether the two sides of this culture war are able to reconcile with each other. I do not have very much hope that we are. I hope that I'm wrong, but I don't think I am. How do I work through that? Time, noticing the reaction when you have it, and observing the reaction. This is something that therapists talk about, and it's something that I try to practice. Notice your feelings. If you can try to um, split not split your personality. <laughs> but if you can try to be an observer of your internal conversation when you're having an emotion like that, and this is good advice for any strong emotion that you have, see if you can simply observe it as if you were an anthropologist doing field work, right? Observe your emotion without necessarily judging whether or not you should have that emotion or whether you're allowed to have it. Um, note why you have it. Note the things that you think about when you have it and just give yourself some time. And like I said, you know, usually after a week or so, I've figured out how I feel about that. And that initial reaction that it's not quite guilt, but it's somewhere in the neighborhood, you know, ooh, I liked that when he said it, but that's extreme. Does, does my liking that mean that I'm a bad person, right? Um, if you've ever experienced anything like that, I think it's normal. But it does go away after you observe it and name it and say this is what you're this is what you're saying to yourself and you give yourself time to contemplate it. It works it, it works its own self out. So I don't know if I have a method, but a, but a, observing, naming, and thinking to yourself about your emotions as you have them is a good way to get through that. I want to read you another email. 
I've had several like this, and I I I will get more of them because the I have sent these emails to people who have shows, podcasts myself. Uh, particularly when I was waking up to the reality of Cluster B, when I was figuring out my mother's derangement and the derangement that has kept my family um, violent, dysfunctional, and poor for so many generations. Dave wrote to me and said, iced coffee, it's the only way to get through summer. Dave says this, I just listened to your latest episode, and all I can say is thank you so much for your program. I grew up in a home with a brother who was, without a doubt, a narcissist. At 12 years old, he stood up in family therapy and announced that, quote, he will not accept a no from anyone in this room, end quote, and that as long as no one tells him no, home life will be peaceful. He was catered to by my parents and my sister, and I was often accused of making trouble by refusing to do so. I followed up my childhood by marrying a woman who was in all likelihood borderline and continued the abuse dynamic for nearly three decades. She used to love goading me into losing my temper, after which she would smirk and say something like, that's abuse, motherfucker. After four decades of questioning my own sanity, you are helping me to see that it wasn't me. That all the people in the thrall of these individuals, parents, counselors, siblings, friends, all of these people who told me that I was the one with the problem, and not that I don't have problems, all of these people were feeding the monsters. You've given voice to things I've held in for years because for me to do so, I was called selfish and ungrateful. I'm not there yet, but I'm on my way to being okay. You're helping me on that path. Thank you, Dave. That makes me feel really good. Um, I'm sorry that, that that has been your experience. I know it intimately. I know exactly how you feel. I have been through it. I've been at exactly the same life trajectory. But... Growing up in a household with a cluster B, and, and yeah, sometimes it's, sometimes it's a sibling. Sometimes the parents themselves may not be personality disordered, but one of the siblings is. And if they are catered to this way, um, what's going on here, the, the roles that are going on in Dave's family, uh, Dave was the scapegoat child. He was to blame for everything, and most especially to blame for not covering up for his brother, who is what we call the golden child, the child who can do no wrong. And it's very common to leave the family home and then re restart these relationships or start new relationships with other, um, with other cluster Bs. He says that he married a borderline, which is very common, especially for kids who come out of homes where they are a caretaker of some sort. Um, they become codependent. And they get personal satisfaction out of fixing somebody else about being the rescuer, right? Spending your life being a rescuer is a terrible way to live. I've spent many years in my life trying to be a rescuer to somebody else. Um, it's toxic. You're not helping them and you're not helping yourself and you're not helping other people in your life. So it's good to wake up to that. Um, so Dave, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the way you feel about what you've learned on my show is exactly the way I felt about Countless, countless people whose, whose insights I listened to, I read about, I watched, helped me to figure out where I was coming from, too. Um, so we're going to take a break here, and when we come back, we're going to talk about COVID, the forever war. See you in a minute. Hey, listeners, guess what? We're on Patreon now. Bringing you this show costs money. Would you chip in to help? Go to patreon.com slash disaffected. That's patreon.com forward slash D-I-S-A-F-F-E-C-T-E-D. Thank you. Welcome back. Let's talk about COVID, shall we? So as things start to return to normal in fits and starts, and even here in the socialist state of Vermont, which has been absolutely terrified and paralyzed for more than a year, although we've had less than 300 deaths from COVID in this entire period, um, I am happy 
to see every day more and more people who are not wearing masks. Uh, many of the stores have dropped their mask requirements. Uh, many of the restaurants have done so. I haven't actually gone back to look at what the governor's orders are because every time I look at that page, I, I get sick to my stomach because he's been issuing all sorts of illegal executive orders, which are, are blatantly against the U.S. Constitution. Not legal at all, but um, it doesn't matter. This is what I call constructive law. Uh, if people decide that the Constitution is inoperative, then as a matter of fact, it is inoperative. We don't actually have constitutional protections if people decide that we don't. So it's just a piece of paper. doesn't matter. What matters is who's in power. Uh, so I don't know what the state of Vermont's actual uh, legal mandate is, but I feel bad for these restaurant workers because they're all still having to wear masks, and it's so universal that I, I suspect that that's part of the governor's order, too. You can let your customers not wear masks if they're fully vaccinated, but, um, you know, your staff have to, for theater, I'm sure. Um, and no, I'm not fully vaccinated, and yes, I am walking into places that say you can take your mask off if you're not vaccinated. I am willfully violating this, um, and I urge you to do so as well in whatever way you can. So there are still people who do not want this forever war to stop because they are living for it. They love it. They like the authoritarianism. They like the moral high ground that they believe that it gives them so that they can lecture other people about being grandma killers. And many of them also like being told what to do. These are people who are very, very happy to be ordered about by government. They like authoritarianism. It is a system in which they are comfortable. Um, they are terrified of making choices for themselves, and they are terrified of owning the responsibility for those choices entirely themselves. So they, they would much rather be told what to do. Um, and you can't have other people. You can't have people like me um, not buckling under to it because then that shows them to look a little silly. So they have to enforce it on the rest of us. Scrolling through uh, the international news, and I saw this this image from... NT News, which I, uh, is an Australian newspaper. This is, uh, I'll describe it for those of you listening. This is uh, the cover of this newspaper. I saw it last week. And it has got, I mean, it's got to be 60-point typeface uh, for the main headline. It's got a graphic of a vaccine syringe. And, and the big text is, just get the damn jab. And that's preceded by the COVID vaccines are safe. The health professionals say so. It's time to end the scare campaigns. The outbreak happening down south is a reminder how quickly this virus can spread. Your family, friends, the Northern Territory and the rest of Australia needs you. So if you're eligible, it's time to just get the damn jab. Fuck you. Hope the Australians are saying fuck you as well. I, it's just absolutely amazing. You do not usually see this. This appears to be based off an editorial because uh, it says coverage page four to five editorial page 20. I don't remember the last time I saw a mainstream newspaper actually take an editorial tone, let alone a dictatorial demanding editorial tone as the feature on their front page. Um absolutely amazing. They want to control you. They don't want to give it up. And the terminally hypochondriac and the career authoritarians are not happy either. On Twitter, tweet from somebody named Helen Branswell. I probably don't have to say this. I'm going to say it anyway. When I when I pull these things up, when I flag them, you know, they're they're representative, right? This is not just one person. I did not go into Twitter and look for the one lone lunatic. Okay. I pick the most representative examples to show you, but there are hundreds, maybe thousands of people expressing similar sentiments behind each one of these. It's not small. May not be the majority, thankfully, um, and it does look as though these people are are slowly declining in numbers. These these forever war fighters, but they're still out there. So Helen Branswell says, 
There were unmasked shoppers in my local grocery store today. The cordons for lineups, the desk where a staffer kept tabs on how many people were in the store, gone. I know this probably isn't rational, but I'm not ready for this. Don't at me. And don't at me means don't respond to me. Oh, really, Helen? Don't at me. Don't respond to me. This is what I call briar patching. Remember when I talked about briar patching? Oh, oh, please do anything to me, but please, please don't throw me in the briar patch. Please don't throw me in the briar patch. Bray Rabbit wants to go in the briar patch, and Helen Branswell does too. Um, she wants to be added. She's saying, don't at me. It's a provocative little shitty passive aggressive, you know, don't contradict me and don't talk back to me. But she wants you to talk back to her so that then she can just, like, have a fit and tell you you're a freaking sociopath. Why don't you care about people? Yeah, I know. I'm doing the voice. There were unmasked shoppers in my local, gro local grocery store. The desk where staffer kept tabs on how many people were in the store. They're all gone. They're gone. Get used to it, Helen. Get used to being a big girl. You can put down your, your Pampers pull-ups or whatever the hell they are and... Put your big girl pants back on. And you want to know what Helen does? <laughs> Take a look at this. This is her, her, her bio on Twitter. Senior writer on infectious diseases for Stat News. 2020 Polk Award winner. Some sports team reference. Conspiracy theory free zone. I block rude and racist. And the best part? She, her. She has her pronouns. <laughs> and two, three hashtags, three hashtags in her Twitter profile, COVID, Ebola, and flu. This woman is a disease groupie. Okay, that's a little unfair because she's an infectious disease writer. That is her beat. But that's the point, isn't it? If she's an infectious disease writer, if she specializes in talking about this, she's swimming in a world of epidemiologists, this woman should know. And, and I know she says that she knows that she's not being rational, but she's not letting her knowledge of her irrationality stop her behavior. She really does want to complain about this stuff, and she really does want people to feel sympathy for her, that she doesn't have the little lines and corrals, and there isn't a Karen over there at the desk keeping tabs on how many people are in the store, because she really liked that. It's a part of this year she really, really liked. And... You know, speaking of which, there was an article in the New York Times a couple of weeks ago. I think it was a survey of more than 700 epidemiologists. These people have lost their goddamn minds. The majority of them didn't want any of these COVID protocols to stop. These are people whose professional expertise is in understanding how diseases spread and understanding how they don't spread. And these people are the most worried their, their level of approval for irrational, punitive, authoritarian lockdowns and, and hygiene theater is much higher than, than you would find if you sampled the opinions of the background population. Something's wrong with this here. I don't know if it was always this way. I haven't paid attention to the opinions of uh, the cultural sort of opinions of epidemiologists before. I didn't have any reason to. Were they always like this? Or is there something about this particular illness, this this particular virus, which is not particularly deadly? I'm going to remind you all of this. Smeared out over everybody who's had COVID, more than 99% of people recover from this. Okay, The elderly die the most, and particularly the elderly with pre-existing conditions, which most of us have by the time we get to, to 80 years old. This is not the Black Death, and it's not Ebola. It's just not. But somehow, this not particularly deadly plague has driven people more insane than any other illness we've seen. I don't know why. Let's look at the New York Times. Vaccine passports. You know, one of the frustrating parts about walking away from leftism is understanding, seeing how many people I wrote off before as conspiracy theorists. And the very fact that that, that term itself is a pejorative should tell us something. 
there are people okay your classic conspiracy theorist take somebody like commentator david ike who literally believes that there are lizard people he actually means lizards he means reptiles that are wearing human suits okay and that's more than it's not exactly a conspiracy that's just a crackpot belief it's a schizotypal type of belief it's it's disconnected from reality but people like this who think who say that the illuminati and the lizard people are really pulling the strings of the world economy well, that's conspiracy theory that's kookiness but conspiracy theorist is has been applied to anybody who questions hygiene theater security theater um, who questions the constitutionality of the COVID lockdowns who questions the proportionality of some of these lockdowns and protocols why is that conspiracies happen right that's not a weird thing that schizophrenics made up. A conspiracy merely means when two or more parties get together away from the public eye and hatch a plan to accomplish a goal through subterfuge or through keeping it very private. That's all it means, right? It's a conspiracy when department heads at a retail store get together about a problem employee and they have a private meeting, the department heads to share their experiences with an employee that they suspect of stealing from the till, um, of covertly harassing their coworkers, they may come together and say, okay, here's what we're going to do to figure out if employee X is doing these things, and here's what we're going to do with this employee if we find out that they are breaking the rules this way. They've just made a conspiracy, right? There's nothing wrong with it. It's not illegal. It's just called management. But that's a conspiracy. That's all that means. So you question things and you get punished and you get called a conspiracy theorist. And that happened this week, this past week, to Naomi Wolf. You remember that I talked about Naomi Wolf on last week's episode and um, praised her for questioning the mainstream liberal consensus, the leftist consensus on vaccines, on, on COVID lockdown protocols, on, on a lot of different things. Um, as a well-known liberal and leftist, Naomi Wolf stands to lose a lot of credibility with the crowd that she runs with professionally and personally because she's questioning things that uh, she's waking up to things that that may not be true. And she's asking questions and she's been punished. Logged on to Twitter a few days ago and, and saw this. Um, Twitter has suspended her account as social media so frequently does to anyone who questions the mainstream narrative. I don't know exactly what they um what they suspended her for. She asks a lot of questions, and yeah, some of them do seem do seem to suppose that circumstances that to me seem unlikely, like you know whether certain pharmaceuticals or certain viruses or parts of viruses are you know, in our public water source, whether that may be a problem. These things seem unlikely to me, but I'm not going to call them kooky anymore because I've seen enough and I've, I've had enough experience where I wrote things off as kooky that were not in fact kooky. And the reason I was doing it was because I needed to be seen as a decent, smart person among my social set, my political set. It had very little to do with whether or not that question needed to be asked and much more to do with 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 managing my social perception. So um, Naomi's husband, Brian O'Shea, claims that she was that her Twitter account was suspended uh, for reading a press release from a state senator to prohibit vaccine passports in Oregon. I don't know if that was the tweet that got her suspended, but it would not at all surprise me. Twitter does this sort of stuff every single day. We should be having state senators and politicians asking whether vaccine passports are a good idea. And what's a vaccine passport? Well, it's the people who want to force you to show a vaccination card, a digital one or a paper one in order to get into certain places. And there are states that are considering having vaccine passports to get into certain businesses. And if you think it's going to stop there, you better think again. 
because there are going to be people who are talking about whether you can cross state lines or provincial lines in Canada without a vaccine passport. This is... It... I don't know why this is so hard for people to see. The kind of people who get into government bureaucracies, there's a whole great big number of them who are just plain authoritarians. And they're there not because they care about serving the public or serving the infrastructure. They're there because it gives them a means to exert control over other people. Of course, they're going to take advantage of a pandemic situation in order to increase their control and their surveillance of other people. Their surveillance and their control is the point. These people don't care about anything they claim to care about. They don't actually care about their political party. They don't actually care about public health. They don't actually care about equitable equitable tax collection and equitable equitable uh, distribution of resources. They care about power, and they will use whatever fig leaf or whatever mask they can get their hands on to mask those intentions. And it's not that hard to see through, folks. Stop taking people at face value. Well, the New York Times... It's talking about vaccine passports. So let me read you a few excerpts from a uh, feature article this week from New York Times. <clears throat> On the Upper East Side in Manhattan, a well-heeled crowd flashed it to get into a socially distanced dance performance at the Park Avenue Armory. In Chelsea, people showed it to attend a John Mulaney stand-up set at City Winery. And in Troy, New York, Patrons are using it to enter an intimate, speakeasy-style bar that only admits vaccinated guests. I'm going to stop there for a second. The tone of this just makes me sick. This is what people mean when they say limousine liberals, latte-drinking liberals. That's exactly what that is. Dance performance at the Park Avenue Armory. Socially distanced. In Chelsea. Fashionable Chelsea. People showed it to attend a John Mulaney stand-up set. And in Troy, they're using it to enter an intimate, speakeasy-style bar. I mean, you can, you can hear the voice. I don't need to do the voice for you. You can hear the voice in the prose. You know, they are with it. They are cosmopolitan. They are urbanites. They are sophisticated. So there's that introduction, and then we get this. This magic ticket is New York State's Excelsior Pass which was introduced in March as the first and only government-issued vaccine passport in the country, accessible, for now, only to people who've been vaccinated in the state. Magic ticket? Excelsior Pass? Is this an infomercial or it is a news story? It's an infomercial, by the way. If you answered news story, you, you failed that question. The whole thing is a promotion of vaccine passports. Let me give you a little more. Officials are hoping that it can help New Yorkers feel confident about the safety of businesses and jumpstart a statewide economy that is still reeling from losses experienced during the pandemic. But in order for that to happen, they will need more people and businesses to start using it and vaccine passports to become more universally accepted. Now, let me translate that for you. Not start to use it and become more universally accepted. What they actually want is to mandate it. They want to mandate it. They're softening people up right now, but they want to mandate it. Officials are hoping that it can help New Yorkers feel confident about the safety of businesses. Why? Let adults sort themselves out. People need to get over the hypochondria and the terror and the safetyism on their own. And you know how they need to do that? They need no training wheels, no bumper guards, no freely passed out masks. Stop strewing rose petals on the ground for these people to keep their delicate feet cushioned with. They need to be thrown right back into the real world that somehow before 2020, they were all able to deal with as sane and rational adults. Stop making the world a preschool for the worried well. <sighs> a couple more quotes from this article. It, it's telling the people they picked. There was nobody in here. Nobody in this entire feature article was a naysayer. They really couldn't find anyone who had questions about this? Sure, they could have. They didn't want to. This is news coverage, right? No, it's not. It's editorial. It's advertorial. So we have, quote, I'm proud of it. 
Scott Hernandez 42 said of his Excelsior Pass. And I wish you guys could see this. Excelsior Pass is capitalized. Yes, I know. I know it's a proper noun because it's a name. It still irritates me. Excelsior Pass. Okay, I have to say something about New York State because I'm originally from New York. I was born in Cortland, New York. Um, I, I spent most of my teen years growing up in, in and around Syracuse, New York. I hate New York State because it is one of the most arrogant, bloated bureaucracies I have ever encountered. Part of my job working in the nonprofit world is legislative analysis, looking at the effects of both statutes and regulations on consumers and on behavior of businesses and, and, and how it shapes how they treat consumers. Uh, and some of my job has been advocating for legislative and regulatory reform. And New York State has always been one of the most difficult places to get any change done, especially in favor of consumers and citizens. Um, the arrogance level of people in Albany is absolutely off the charts. You want to talk about narcissistic personality disorder? Albany is the sine qua non of narcissistic personality disorder. I have had conversations with everyone from bureaucrats up to legislators in Albany at, about uh, proposing changes to the law. And sometimes their first reaction is a scoff or a laugh. And they say, it's not going to happen here. This is Albany. And they say it as if it was insulting for me to suggest it. I, You know, it's not just me. Anybody who's worked with Albany knows this. They are incredibly full of themselves. Excuse me. Thank you. Thank you for letting me give you that, that digression. So Scott Hernandez is proud of his Excelsior Pass. He talked to the reporter as he waited to see if there was room for him and his friends to have dinner at the winery. <laughs> There needs to be more education about it. Mm. Educate yourself. No, Scott, I'm not going to. Then we go to Auburn, New York. Uh, that's close to my old stomping grounds. Auburn is a smaller city in upstate New York, um, about 30, 40 minutes outside of Syracuse. I have family there. In Auburn, New York, a tiny five-table chocolate store, Gretchen's Confections and Cafe. Christ was inundated with social media hate from around the country after photos of a sign asking people to be vaccinated to sit indoors went viral. The store decided to take down its sign, and now it welcomes everyone. Do you hear this cloying language? Now it welcomes everyone. I have to expect her to say, now it embraces everyone. Lean in. Embrace. Ugh. Get your hands off me. Quote, it is very polarizing, said Gretchen Christensen, the owner. They've been calling us Hitler and fascists, segregation cafe. I think the number of people against it is tiny, but they're just extra loud and threatening. You know, I, I, I believe that. And, and to the extent that, um, that people were actually threatening and, and aggressively rude, it's, it's outrageous. You know how people behave online. Um, I believe they got some of that, and I, I don't approve of it even a little bit. But I also know about people who claim people on the left and people who are in the mainstream, people who are favored by our current cultural moment, who have the catbird seat culturally. I also know that they exaggerate and they lie. They claim victimhood all the time. Um, so I, I question how many of the responses were actually threatening. You know, People on the left these days, any disagreement with them, they will call a threat. They'll call it abuse. They'll call it gaslighting. They'll call it denying their right to exist. They'll call it violence. So you'll, you'll pardon me for wondering exactly how much of that they got versus just not liking the fact that people told them where to stick it. A couple more. When Matt... Baumgartner announced that one of his bars, the Berlin Lounge in Troy, New York, hey, Kevin, that's your stomping grounds, would only allow vaccinated guests because of its small size and lack of outdoor space. He was also hit with social media hate. <laughs> social media hate. Hate. Why are you being a hater? Stop hating. In both cases, loyal customers rallied in support and the lounge and shop have been doing well in recent weeks. And here's the clincher, folks. 
In both cases, now yeah, I already read that. I'm someone who very strongly believes in the vaccine, and part of me feels like I'm getting to visit more. I just bollocks that up. Let me start again. I'm someone who very strongly believes in the vaccine, and part of me feels like getting to visit more places is kind of a reward, Mr. Baumgartner said. <laughs> Kevin just sent me a note. You see me looking over to the side. Uh, uh, sometimes Kevin needs to give me directions sort of off stage, and I know that I give it away because I keep looking over there. Uh, but he says about the Berlin Lounge in Troy, I walked out of there and told them to fuck off. <laughs> Listen to that. A part of me feels like getting to visit more places is a kind of reward. Who are you, Matt Baum Baumgartner? Who do you think you are? Just because you want to live in a cage doesn't mean we have to live in a cage with you. This is what's wrong with people like this. They, they don't mind being boxed in. They don't mind being restricted. They don't mind having their rights abrogated as long as they can look like the good person, but they mind very much when you won't have any of it. They want you in that cage with them. They will pull you, to, this is the crab bucket, right? It's the proverbial crab bucket. Instead of actually being happy that any of their fellow crabs escape from the bucket, as soon as one gets up to the top, the other crabs who are still at the bottom take a claw and pull him right back down. I don't wanna be in your crab bucket, Matt. And finally, Anthony Fauci. You all have heard, I'm not going to do very much about this. Um, you can get that anywhere. You all have heard that um, a Freedom of Information Act request from the Washington Post and, and another journalistic institution got a cache of thousands of emails between um, Dr. Anthony Fauci and correspondents within the scientific community and outside the world and the amazing hypocrisy of this man. Amazing hypocrisy. Masks. Those of you who like masks, wear the masks to be safe, wear the masks outside, wear the mask when you're walking with people who aren't in your household, mask, 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 mask. If you don't wear a mask, you're a sociopathic grandma killer. Remember how you made fun of us? No, not just made fun of us. You, you, you shamed us. You questioned our character. You did, many of you actually call us sociopathic. I have been called sociopathic for refusing to wear a mask. Let's see what Anthony Fauci had to say in, oh, February of 2020, just before our big pandemic. He has, um, he received an email from um, a Sylvia Burwell who had some questions about um, mask and hygiene protocols. This is Dr. Fauci, Anthony, uh, Anthony, <laughs> answering Sylvia Burwell. Sylvia, masks are really for infected people to prevent them from spreading infection to people who are not infected rather than protecting uninfected people from acquiring infection. The typical mask you buy in the drugstore is not really effective in keeping out the virus, which is small enough to pass through the material. It might, however, provide some slight benefit in keeping out gross droplets if someone coughs or sneezes on you. I do not recommend that you wear a mask, particularly since you are going to a very low-risk location. Your instincts are correct. Money is best spent on medical countermeasures such as diagnostics and vaccines. Safe travels. Best regards, Tony. Sounds perfectly reasonable to me. Is it reasonable to you now? Is it reasonable because Dr. Fauci said it? Yeah? It's not crazy when he says it, right? It's not sociopathic when he says it. Is it okay now? Jesus Christ. This. All of this. And this is not the only thing they found in his email. They found a lot of correspondence between Fauci and other researchers questioning whether or not this virus was in fact a lab leak from the Wuhan Institute of Virology. And everybody who said that, everybody who supposed that, everybody who asked that question got booted off Facebook, got booted off Twitter, got mocked by the Washington Post, CNN, MSNBC, the New York Times, people like Rachel Maddow. They were all called crazy. And not only crazy, 
but mean. They wanted to hurt other people, and that was the only reason they were questioning this stuff. People have lost their minds. It does not take Dr. Anthony Fauci to tell you this, okay? Any reasonable person with a normal level of adult intelligence can look up the size of a typical virus particle and then look up the size of, of a hole in the weave of a mask and do basic physics. This is like goddamn Sesame Street. Or it's like, remember those toys you had when you were a toddler? I think Fisher Price made them. Uh, multicolored toys that had cutouts of shapes, like a star shape and a circle shape. And, and there were blocks that fit those indented recessed shapes. And you figured out if you turned it this way, then it would fit in there. It's like your first puzzle. That's the level of this stuff we're talking about. Ooh, virus this big? Hole between the fibers in a mask this big? Virus can go through. Honestly. Okay, I'm getting hot in here. It's time for an air conditioning break. We are going to take a break. Get a notebook before the next segment because we, we've got some fun. We're going to play a video, and I'm going to show you what a borderline personality disorder meltdown and manipulation session looks like in real time. See you on the other side of the break. Thanks so much for listening. Would you take just a minute right now and share our show on social media? On Disaffected, we take a close look every week at the abuse dynamics exploding in the dark and disordered world that we live in. Tell other people about us. Welcome back. I saw a little video this week that is just perfect to show you a real-time example of the kinds of manipulation that people with borderline personality disorder engage in. As always, I do not know these people. I can't actually make a diagnosis of anybody. I should actually plug this again. Uh, if you would like to know my stance um, on noticing personality pathology in other people, the second episode of this show back in January or early February is called Don't Diagnose um, because people who talk about personality disorders and personality pathology in public um, are often chastised by people who say, don't diagnose, you're not a doctor, you don't know what you're talking about, you can't do that, da 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 I talk about in that episode, first of all, I'm not actually diagnosing. Because I am not a doctor, I don't actually have the power to diagnose. Diagnosing means making a medical assessment or a psychiatric assessment of somebody in a, uh, a client, doctor, or a provider-patient relationship. So even if I say the exact same words, that such a person would say, I'm not actually making a diagnosis because none of this is going in anybody's chart. None of this is influencing their medical treatment. I'm not doing or saying anything that's going to have any material effect on that person and how they are treated by their medical providers. But more than that, don't diagnose is usually just a fancy way of saying, shut up, don't notice it, don't connect the dots, don't illustrate the pattern for other people, stay in your lane. And my answer to that is no, this is my lane. You can watch, but you can stay out of my lane. So I don't know these people, but I do know the classic symptoms and behavior patterns that are consistent with borderline personality disorder. I know them intimately from my mother. I know them from many friends I've had over the years and people that I've encountered. So what we're going to look at here is a, f a few video clips from a podcast called Femsplainers, Femsplainers, which is a, a clever take on, I, I would guess, mansplainers. Um, and the host is um, Danielle Crittenden is the host. This is her podcast. And she has on an author named Nancy Jo Sales. Uh, and Nancy Jo has just written a book about her experience using dating apps as an older woman. Um, and... Some of this will be very obvious to you, but I'm going to stop in a couple of places and point out some specific behaviors um, and what they mean, uh, because I think there's value in being able to identify them. We're going to talk a little bit about what animates these behaviors, why such people do this. Um, so let's, uh, let's start out with the first clip, Kevin. So when you went and you started with the dating apps, 
what did you what did you hope for? What were you expecting? Were you looking to meet someone? Of course. Or, or, or I was were looking, looking for the same thing that everyone who goes on a dating app is looking for. I was looking for sex, love, companionship, anybody who dates. I was just a person who dates. I was looking for I had had my heart broken. I was looking to be with somebody. If that was for, you know, if that was for one night, I'm not not open to that. That can be really fun before. <laughs> I mean, once upon a time it was, but I was looking for connection, just like everybody else who dates. I am no different from anyone else. Are you saying, are you, do you think that there's something different about me personally? Okay. <laughs> oh boy. So the context of this, and this doesn't become clear until you watch uh, a little bit more of this, but I believe that somebody at Femsplainers either wrote a review of Nancy Joe's book or, or that a, a discussion of a review of her book preceded this because she seems to have come into the interview with some negative feelings about, um, about this review. Um, and, and they seem to have tainted her conversation with Danielle, the host here. So, did you notice from the minute that Nancy Jo Sales started talking, she came in, her facial expressions, her tone of voice, the way she phrased things, you could immediately detect that she was seeing Danielle, the host, as an enemy or somebody who was going to try to get her. So she came into this conversation um, in a combative mode to begin with. And... If you listen to what Danielle says, and then you listen to what Nancy Joe says, how did we get to, are you saying, I think you're saying that she's putting words into her mouth and she's in the beginning of an attempt to start a projective identification scenario with Danielle. I talked about that on last week's show. Projective identification is when a person who needs an enemy, they need somebody to be their enemy so that they can perform victimhood or they can perform vanquishing an enemy. <clears throat> they make other people into enemies and they will twist their words and they will bring in unwarranted assumptions about the bad intentions of their interlocutor in order to make that person an enemy. She's trying to start this right now. She's trying to get, and projective identification is when they do that and they annoy, irritate, or frighten the other person so much that that other person does start reacting negatively, does start yelling. And so the original person says, see, you're just what I thought you were. It's a manipulation. So are you saying, I think you're saying, anyway, let's go on. No, when I, I, went I'm, into I'm, I'm, I think maybe you've been hurt by this review and you see that any questioning of your experience, which you wrote about so frankly, is somehow judgmental. And I'm trying to, mm -hmm understand your reaction to it in the context of how disheartening these apps, your thesis, these apps have made dating. Um, and, and, and one of the things I, I, that I was surprised by that if you are, because I think we're actually exact contemporaries, I may be one year older than you are. If you are looking for companionship, you set your, your parameters, I think for 25 to 29 year old young men, correct? Is that wrong? Well, no, I don't think it's going to necessarily lead to the kind of companionship that you would want. Why do you think that? Because I don't think men of that age are necessarily looking to get married. I don't want to get married to anybody. I don't want to get married. Maybe they're not also susceptible to long-term relationships at that age. So you do think that it was on me? Yeah. <laughs> yeah why do you think that so you do think it's on me why do you think that this this is this is what somebody does who's um, incredibly insecure okay she already is trying to make Danielle her enemy and now she's moving into she's moving into gaslighting a little bit because she's starting 
to put words in Danielle's mouth that Danielle did not say. She's trying to impute to Danielle a judgmental and condescending attitude that I don't hear or see in Danielle. Um, these, these are fears that Nancy Joe has about herself. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to try to leave the snark aside here. I don't have a lot of time for borderlines, but I do recognize what their syndrome is about. I do know where it comes from. It comes from insecurity. It comes from a broken personality that doesn't have a normal ability to self-soothe, to self-validate, to keep boundaries between another person and the self and still feel good about the self, even if the person on the other side of that boundary doesn't really like you or doesn't agree with you or thinks you should reconsider something. This is this is coming from a place of desperate fear and insecurity. It does not make the behavior okay. It doesn't make the behavior pro-social. It's not pro-social. It's negative. It's combative. It's dishonest. But it comes from a place of fear. And it's projection. Let's go on. That, that the reason no, why I, just, I had... I just the, the, was, the reason why I had these experiences, which included sexual assault, was on me. Okay. Mm. leave the snark aside leave the snark aside this did you hear that and I had these experiences which included sexual assault and that's on me this is just like throwing a bomb into someone's living room it's just being incendiary she's trying to make Danielle an unsympathetic interlocutor who is now blaming Nancy Joe, <clears throat> excuse me, blaming Nancy Joe for her own sexual assault. This is victimology 101. If there's anything that a person with borderline personality disorder wants to be, it's a victim. Okay. And and yeah, sometimes they are victims. In their childhood, almost all the time they were victims of child abuse. That's where this distorted personality comes from. It comes from child abuse. It comes from the kind of child abuse that I experienced. Um, I have no idea what Nancy Joe Sales' uh, family life is like. No idea whatsoever. But this is where borderline personality disorder comes from. Um, and this reminded me, think back a few months ago when I talked about Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, um, who after the Capitol riot where she had to make herself into the world's biggest victim, even though she wasn't even in the building that got broken into, and she had to accuse the cop who came to uh, alert her and her staff members of being aggressive and frightening her when he was actually trying to help them and protect them. And she did an Instagram video, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez did, <clears throat> talking about her trauma and yeah, I'm going to do the voice because this is the voice that she does. And she does the eyes, too. It's, it's Bambi, right? It's Bambi. It's, it's a little girl. It's a little girl. She's frightened. And she needs protection. And she was really, really scared. I, 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 this, it just makes my skin crawl. And she, Ocasio-Cortez, did the same thing. She talked about how she was a sexual assault survivor. So she has trauma from this. And this is why she's so traumatized. They've got to get in every single victim point. And what's really gross about this, in my view, is not only did she just drop this in there for sympathy, for victim points, but she managed to do it in a way where she accused Danielle Crittenden, the host, of blaming her, Nancy Joe, for her own sex sexual assault. That never happened. Let's go on. Because I set my no, discovery I'm not, wrong? You're, 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 no, you're projecting. What I'm trying to say is that when you invite a 27-year-old man you don't know to your apartment to have quick sex that minute, not like even get to know, not even for a Listen, drink, you're, that, that's not going to lead to the last you, you You've crossed the line. I'm sorry. You've crossed the line. I'm so How did I cross the line? Because... What you just said was so slut shaming. Notice this. Did you notice her change of affect? She went from 
She went from a little bit indignant to more in sorrow than in anger. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. You really crossed a line. Oh, oh, I'm so disappointed. Oh, oh, why did you do that? That, that, that change of presentation. This is theater. She may not even consciously experience this as theater. I, I, I am never quite sure. And I don't think anybody can be quite sure. I think sometimes it's, a, it's an active put on. I think other times it's become so second nature to them that they don't really notice what they're doing. Right. And you see this. Um, that's a feature of, of histrionic personality disorder as well. Um, rapidly changing, but very shallow emotions that don't seem sincere. You can go through them really, really quickly. And you think to yourself, how can someone be feeling joy and desperate sorrow and then um, beleaguered disappointment? How can they really be feeling all of those things in such a rapid time frame of a few seconds or a few minutes? And the answer is they aren't really feeling all of these things necessarily all the time. But she's retreating into, into this affect of, you have wounded me, I'm very disappointed, um, you've crossed a line. She's trying to establish, she's trying to get the audience and the listeners on her side to see Daniel Crittenden as, as an abuser. I mean, it's, it's just affectation. Let's go. Let's look and at the I, next I one. I wanted to see how it's slut-shaming. Oh. Tell me how I'm slut-shaming. Tell me how I'm slut-shaming. I will tell you in a second. I will tell you in a second. You interrupt me a lot too, which I wish you wouldn't do. I wish you would allow me to finish my thoughts before you start talking again. Can I do that? Go ahead. Can I do that? Can so I do that? I would love for this to work out. I would love to be able to talk to you, you know, in a in a way that's positive and helps people listening who've been through these things as I have to know that they're not alone. I feel from our conversation and the things that you've said to me so far, I feel judged by you and I feel slut shamed by you. And these are things that I have a right to feel based on what you've said. And you, I think are in the position as the interviewer to want to know why I feel that way, not to argue that I shouldn't. But I didn't, I asked you, why do okay, you feel that way? Okay, okay, maybe you would learn something more, not just about me, but about this culture, about what young women, young people are going through. If you would listen to what I have to say. <laughs> oh, there's a smorgasbord in there. First of all, young people, young women, you're 58 years old, Miss Sales. 58 years old. You're not a young woman. Uh, slut shaming. I feel very slut shamed. You know what slut shaming? Ugh. She feels slut shamed because she feels like a slut. Not because of what Danielle Crittenden said to her. Not because of how men have treated her. Because of her own behavior. Slut shaming is the cri de coeur of so many borderline women. You're slut shaming me. You're slut shaming me for my outfit. You're saying I deserve to be raped because I was showing cleavage. Nobody's saying that. The few people who do say that, there are men out there who say things like that and they are, they're disgusting. They're depraved. And they probably are rapists or rape sympathizers. Those men exist. I see them. They do harass women. But there aren't that many of them. And This is, okay, slut shaming. I've, I've got to talk about this. I've got a couple other things I'm going to point out about Nancy Joe, but I've got, I have got to talk about this. Mm. Part of what bothers me about contemporary, modern, whether you call it third wave or fourth wave feminism, is it is an ideology of having your cake and eating it too. And slut shaming is part of that. These are women who say, I don't deserve to be raped because I'm wearing certain kinds of clothes. That's absolutely true. Any decent person knows that. Clothing does not justify rape. It doesn't. P 
period, end of story. You don't have to convince us of this. You don't have to convince men of this either. The only men who believe that are men who are rapists or rape sympathizers, okay? But they want to forestall any criticism. They don't want, they want to have their cake and eat it too. They want to wear what they want and send sexual signals, deliberate sexual signals, and not be noted for sending sexual signals. That's the have your cake and eat it too. I call this, I, I have a little model in my head. I call it the Burger King uniform scenario. Imagine that you are in a Burger King. You're standing in line, getting ready to order your food, and you notice somebody standing in line next to you wearing a Burger King uniform. Clearly, this is a, a, a staff member who's on break. So you say to the staff member who's standing in line next to you, hey, have you, have you tried the new rodeo cheeseburger? And the staff member turns and says, what? How dare you, sir? How dare you assume that I work here? Why do you just treat me like a service worker? What am I, what, just because I'm wearing a uniform? It's because I'm wearing a Burger King uniform. You think I work here? What is wrong with you? Discrimination, excuse me. Discrimination up in here. Bullshit. This is, you see so much of this. Particularly young women, not exclusively, but particularly young women who wear deliberately provocative clothes. And that's fine. You may do so. Nobody is telling you what clothes you can and cannot wear. But don't tell me that that plunging neckline and the artfully arranged bra that has pushed your cleavage up and the really short skirt and the high heels or fishnet stockings or whatever else it is that young people wear out to clubs, do not tell me that you did not mean to send signals that say sexually available because that is exactly why you put that outfit on. You are looking for sexual attention. I don't know whether you are looking to get laid that night. I don't know whether you're looking simply for admiring glances. And these things are okay, right? Young people do this, right? I'm not a woman, but I did the male version of these things when I was a young guy out in the gay clubs. The gay guys do it all over the place. The men do it too. They get all buffed up, you know, put on their cologne, put on their tank top, you know. This is what young people do. This is courtship behavior. It's sexual signaling. It's normal. It's natural. But don't tell me that you don't know what you're doing. So this whole slut shaming thing is often used to shut people up who say, wait a minute, first of all, you weren't raped, you weren't assaulted. You are angry that somebody treated you like you were sexually available as if you weren't trying to signal that you were sexually available. That's a manipulation and it's bullshit. And going back to Nancy Jo Sales here, she feels slut shamed because she acts like a slut and she knows that she acts like a slut. And don't get angry at me. I've been a slut. I've barely known any gay men who weren't sluts. I'm a retired slut. I know all about this game. All about it. She feels dirty. And this is, this is the sad part. This is the part where if you want to try to find some empathy for people who are dealing inside of their minds like this, you can find it here. She's a 58-year-old woman. She's past her sexual peak. I'm sorry, 58-year-old women do not have high sexual market value. That's not a criticism. It's not a slur. It is the way things are. I'm not approving of it. I'm not disapproving of it. I'm saying that for the most part, men in their, in their late 20s are not going to be that interested in a 58-year-old woman. She knows this. She feels age coming on. She knows that she's past her sexual prime. She knows that in, in the eyes of society, she's losing her looks. She's scared. And if she's like many of the people that I have known who are like her, I mean, if she, you know, if she is the kind of person that, that I suspect that she is, um, she may have had a really good time when she was young. She may have done a lot of stepping out. She may have had a lot of promiscuous sex. Again, I'm not judging her. Um, and she may feel fear that she's closer to the end of life than she is to the beginning of life and that she can't have that lifestyle back because that's something that only the young can have. I understand this. I mean, not, not, 
not to, you know, maybe not to the degree of somebody like this, but <sighs> young gay men are very like this. I was like this. We're, we're vain. We are both proud and boastful about our looks, but we're also terrified that other people are hotter than we are. Um, so we're both narcissistic and brittle. And we are considered aged out of the gay dating scene and the club scene when we're in our mid to, to late 20s, right? So I understand this. But these are about Nancy Joe's own internal thoughts about herself. Danielle didn't say anything, any of these things to her. These are things that Nancy Joe is saying to herself, but she's projecting them onto someone else. And what she's also doing here, she's trying to turn an interview into a therapy relationship. She's trying to place Danielle in an inappropriate role that is not Danielle's responsibility to Nancy Joe. You know, she says, well, I really hope to do, you should really be able to hear this less defensively. She's she's acting like, Nancy Joe's acting like she's hired Danielle as her therapist and now she has to lecture her therapist because her, her therapist isn't therapizing properly. This is all manipulation. I think we have one more, so let's roll the last bit. And also to listen to what I have to say about what you said and not be defensive and not think that, you know, I'm just overreacting to a bad review or something. And once again, that person knew me and we have a weird history. It's something so petty. It's not even worth talking about. But people who know you and had little disputes over time with you should not be writing reviews of your book. So can I tell you what I think is slut shaming about what you said? Go ahead. And what I think that my... I'm pretty sure a lot of my friends and young women friends would think it's slut shaming about what you said. What I believe you said was, what were you thinking? You set your discovery at men in their 20s and you're old. <laughs> projection. I, I've got to give Danielle credit here. She, you heard her say it earlier. She said, you're projecting. I don't know Danielle, um, but I suspect just watching how she reacts to Nancy Joe that this is not the first borderline rodeo Danielle has been on. I think she knows this kind of character, and I think she knows how to deal with it because she's not she's not allowing herself to be pulled into it. She's not allowing herself to be manipulated or guilted. She's not apologizing. She's not being combative. Danielle is not being combative. She's being firm, and she's keeping firm boundaries. She's not allowing herself to be introduced but she is allowing nancy joe to talk and nancy joe keeps saying you know if you'll let me talk if you let me talk you interrupt me a lot nancy joe interrupts her just as much i mean this happens in interviews you know you step on each other uh unintentionally or you say oh wait 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 and i come back to a point it's nancy joe who's making this into some form of of social abuse that it's not um and 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 she's just making up accusations now she's saying that danielle accused her of being old no, she didn't. No, she didn't. It's right there on tape. Nancy Joe said, I think we're exact contemporaries. I think I might be a year older than you. I'm 58 years old. Nancy, uh, Danielle Crittenden has no problem uh, telling the world her age. She's not pretending to be a younger woman than she is. Nancy Joe, in her mind, thinks she's a lot younger than she really is. Notice how she keeps appealing to what her young women friends would think. What would young women do? Nancy, you're not young. You're 57, 58 years old. You're not young. I don't want to hear what young, young women would think this is slut shaming. Yeah, because there's a lot of young women out there who've been brought up on that bullshit brand of feminism. You know, the Burger King brand where you can wear the outfit, but you can get angry at somebody if they assume you're an employee. <laughs> it's, it's sad. There's just one more. Let's do that one. And well, so you're my age, so I called myself old too. Okay. I'm 58. Actually. Okay, so you are. You're saying that I, I'm old, so I'm not. Uh, no, no, I'm just saying it's a big disparity, okay. uh, for male or female. Oh, and what is okay? So here's my questions going through my mind when you say these things to me. So, <laughs> I mean, so what is wrong with that? I mean, I don't really get what's wrong with that to you, but, um, and what were you thinking? Because when you had these young men come over to your house and you just 
had them come over to have quick quickie sex. Well, I don't know where in my book you got that that's what that's your projection because there's no, no there was there was incident after incident. It's not my projection. It's incident this. after incident. Where are my pearls? Where are my pearls? Uh, uh, I've got to hand it to Danielle. She really keeps her cool here. This is bullshit. This is just bullshit. I haven't read her book, obviously, but you know what? I do trust that Danielle is being honest about what's in her book. I do believe her. If somebody goes out and reads Nancy Jo Sales' book, God bless you, and you find that Danielle misrepresented it, send me an email at disaffected.fm. I will read it, and then I'll check for myself, and if I'm wrong, I will correct myself. But that's not going to happen. Um, because Nancy Jo apparently did write a book where she talked about having casual quickie sex encounters with men between 25 and 29. Then she invited over to her house and had their clothes off within a few minutes of being there. She did. And now she's saying she didn't say that. I don't know where you're finding. I don't know where. And then you're like, what were you thinking? What were you? Danielle never said that. What she said was sensible. What do you expect from 25 year old men of the type who respond to your advertisement on a dating app to have quick anonymous sex. They come over and have quick anonymous sex and leave you and never speak to you again. That's exactly what you should expect. And she doesn't want to take any responsibility for it. I, where are my pearls? Where are my pearls? The judgment is coming from inside Nancy's head, not Danielle. It's coming from Nancy. Danielle has a realistic idea of, of, of what people act like at certain ages and what you can expect out of certain scenarios. And Nancy Joe wants the world to be the way the world isn't. And frankly, play slut games, get slut prizes. And Nancy Joe, you, you brought this on yourself. We're going to take a break before we finish this out. Come back. Hey, listeners, guess what? We're on Patreon now. Bringing you this show costs money. Would you chip in to help? Go to patreon.com slash disaffected. That's patreon.com forward slash D-I-S-A-F-F-E-C-T-E-D. Thank you. When you subscribe, hit that notification bell and stay with us in real time as we take a new close look every week and examine how to identify and contend with the abuse dynamics at play in the world around us. Welcome back. I want to close this show out by sharing some words from somebody who I follow on Twitter, a woman named A. Sophia. I don't know her well, but she has also been through the ringer with cluster B personality types, and she's developed a lot of wisdom. And I find that she is able to distill these, t these, these character types and, and what I think is the correct and wise way to look at them into simple, concise prose. And she's talking about character. You recall that the cluster B personality disorders um, more commonly in the past, you don't hear this very much anymore, uh, but they, they are also, or they were also called character disorders. We don't like to talk about character at all. We find it judgy. And I could go down that rabbit hole about why judgy is, is not a bad thing, but I've done it before and I'll do it again, so I'll spare you here. We don't like to talk about character because we don't like to talk about responsibility and character, building your own character, maintaining good character, and honestly assessing your character flaws and working on them is your responsibility. It is every individual person's responsibility. And we live in an era in which we don't have personal responsibility. We, are, we live in an era when we get our self-esteem and our sense of value by being victims of other people who are allegedly more powerful than we are. We are infantile. We're infantile. So I'm going to read, um, I'm going to read these tweets to you. A. Sophia says, Throughout the 80s and 90s, we took a compassionate view, preaching that there are no bad people only bad behaviors. 
This made it taboo to identify poor and toxic characters. We became purposefully blind and ignorant, allowing evil to proliferate while we gagged our ability to name it. We parrot this judge people on their character line, but somehow we can't really name what constitutes poor character. We've lost that ability. And when we see it, we don't judge it. We don't condemn it harshly. We make excuses for it. We reimagine the person as good instead. Another way this is expressed is don't demonize people or don't dehumanize people. I have some bad news for you. Evil people are already doing it to innocent others with impunity. You can't stop them or convince them not to. Refraining from naming evil allows them to get away with it. Yes, yes, it does. Yes, it does. This is why... This is why I say on the show that my mother is a bad person. Because there's all sorts of room in our culture for her trauma, his trauma. They were traumatized. They only act this way because they were traumatized. I know how people act because they were traumatized. I grew up with it. I became it. I acted in a lot of bad ways because I was traumatized. That does not take the responsibility off my shoulders for my own bad behavior. It doesn't take the responsibility off my mother's shoulders for her own bad behavior or anyone else's or any of the other kinds of people that we talk about on this show. You know what is amazing to me? People love to quote Martin Luther King and one of the favorite lines from him is the line about judging people on the content of their character, not the color of their skin. And as A. Sophia says, we like to say that, but we won't acknowledge character. How, how, can, we judge the char- how can we judge someone on the content of their character when we won't acknowledge that character is a real thing and that it matters? What is the content of their character? We're not even allowed to say it. Every time you say, he's bad. This is a bad guy. He, he abuses his wives. He abuses his underlings at work. Oh, no, no, no. He just behaves badly. He's not bad. He just behaves badly. What is this? What are we afraid of? I'm not, I'm not sure. I'll... There, there are probably many reasons why we do this, but I think that some of it has to do with the fact that if we judge someone else's character, we are aware that they will judge us back. If we stare into the abyss, the abyss will stare back at us. And we don't want to be judged. And that's normal and natural to a certain degree, but it's become pathological. It's become excessive. It's become inflated. We are terrified of being judged. We need to stop that because... We're protecting ourselves by failing to judge other people. And when we fail to judge other people, we put our children at risk. We put our body politic at risk. We put our public policy at risk. We put ourselves at risk. So, yeah, this is a shared responsibility. It's for you and it's for me, too. You take the good and the bad. A couple other thoughts from A. Sophia. And this, this conversation that I'm, these, these words that I'm reading to you, they, they happened in the context of a conversation on Twitter um, that A. Sophia was involved in that I, I was, I said a few things about, but mostly just observed. There was a guy who was talking about psychopaths and psychopathy. And he, he seemed to He was one of those people who is still in the stage of demonstrating his empathy for the personality disorder. That's my view. He may see it differently. Well, you know, they they weren't born that way. Something happened to them. You know, they can be 
You know, we need to understand them. We need to empathize with them. This is all fine as far as it goes, but it never goes just as far as it goes. It always goes over into making excuses for other people and being more concerned, more concerned about saying, hey, hey, don't call him a bad person than you are about the actual psychopathic behaviors of the person in question. That is a perversion of your moral focus. That's not right and it's not sensible. It's a it's a perversion. Hmm. So she says, the unwillingness to see the evil, to believe what we see, to summon the courage to get angry and take a strong moral position against a person based on our perception of their character is a form of denial. That denial allows evil to multiply and normalize itself. That's how we arrive at a place where people are writing about their genocidal plans, their murderous fantasies, spewing unrestrained hatred of all kinds, plotting to destroy our entire way of life, and we do nothing. Because now, this is normal. Evil has become the norm. Yes, it has. And I know, I know some of you want to say that's an exaggeration, it's overblown, it's histrionic. This is especially frustrating for me. <laughs> because as I've told you before, I know very well that I have histrionic parts of my character. Right. I know that they're part of me. Um, they're under better control than they used to be. But a little bit of it. There's good and bad to these character traits. Right. When histrionics get out of control, you end up looking like the boy who cried wolf. And, and there have been times in my life when my my emotional reactions to things were excessive and were histrionic and they were wearing on people. Right. There's a reason why people are only willing to listen to so much of this before they start saying, is there really a wolf there? So I have some responsibility for that, you know, about how I've lived my life. But it's frustrating to me um, because it's, it's not just th the reaction that people have to people like me who say we are living in a cluster B world is that we are the histrionics. We are the crazy ones. So this is, this is a battle that, that, goes on inside my head. This is my work to do. I'm just sharing it out loud with you. And I would say this as would any person, but I really don't think I'm deluded. I don't think I'm seeing this incorrectly. I don't think I have put on cluster B glasses that are making people who are normal appear to be cluster B. I think I've figured it out. I think I've gotten to an age and a level of experience where I have one of the, the qualities that, that my therapist says he, he, tells his, his clients that they need to develop discernment, being able to truly discern between a mistake and an aggression, between being misguided and being malevolent. I wasn't so good at that for a lot of my life, but I think I'm better at it now. And A. Sophia is right. We are in denial. We don't want to believe there are bad people. But more than that, we don't want other people to believe it, and we sure don't want them to say it. And this is why when you talk about parents who are getting ready to put their gender nonconforming children onto puberty blockers and then onto cross-sex hormones, which is going to lead to a life of sterility, osteoporosis, early death from cancer and heart disease, not to mention lack of ability to orgasm, lack of ability to be sexually fulfilled, and possibly onto mutilating surgery for genitals. When you see these parents in normal times with normal sane people, anyone would instantly see this for the evil that it is. Anyone would instantly see that this is Munchausen syndrome by proxy. This is a parent with borderline personality disorder. But we can't see it now because it's been normalized. And the people who object to it and who point it out, we are called the evil ones. We pull the curtain back and they don't want the curtain pulled back. Pull the curtain back. Take a risk. Speak up. Judge. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to go overboard sometimes. You're going to have to correct yourself. And when you do, take responsibility for it. Say, I was wrong and say it in front of other people, especially to the person you wronged if you wrong someone. But in front of the people that you were declaiming, something too that should not to be wrong take responsibility and say hey guys i was wrong 
You can't stop yourself from making mistakes, you're human. But you do not have to put down your moral judgment just because society doesn't want to hear it now. It's one of the only tools we have to regulate human behavior. So do your part, and that's this week's show. Thank you, as always, for joining me. I'll see you next week.